All right, so it's Asif and Susan Handley. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, you know, we were talking before about the whole story of migration. First of all, with Europe in 2010 expiring uh, in terms of the support that Microsoft is gonna offer, this topic came to my mind. I'm like, let's, we should talk about this more. Uh, there are lots of companies who are currently migrating from Sherpa 2010 out or have migrated in the last year. What kind of environment are they going to? Are they doing the right things or not? And Sue being the information architecture expert, I wanted to pick her brain on this and a lot more things. So before we get into just, not just Sherpa 2010, obviously all kinds of migration and information architecture things. Sue, if you want to introduce yourself first, go for sure. it. Uh, so I'm Sue Hanley, and I am an information architect and business analyst specializing in building collaboration and internet solutions on the Microsoft platform, so SharePoint and Microsoft 365, uh, solutions that actually deliver real value to real people. And my background um, was actually in data modeling, and then I ran the knowledge management program for a very large global consulting firm. Then I ran the portal practice for what became Dell Professional Services. Nice. And then about 15 years ago, hung out a shingle. And now I do all the same things I've been doing for the last 40 years, but I do them for me. <laughs> That's awesome. All or for right. clients that I love, I should say. You mentioned uh, for things that actually get used or something like that you just mentioned right now. That's that's exactly where my story begins also. And I used to be a, a developer. I don't know if, I, if you knew this long, 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 long time ago. Then from that, I went into training, development, and then administration, then power user training. These days, last many years now, I would say about seven, eight years, I've really focused on the end user and power user market and uh, understanding exactly where do where are we failing currently as a SharePoint Microsoft 365 ecosystem and also as, as, as companies as a whole as to why are things are not getting used efficiently in the right way. So that's what I focus on much more deeply. I run a company called Visual SP. I founded this company. Uh, well, the, the original founding was 2005 as a different uh, Thing altogether, then became a software company in 2012. We focus very much on getting the best value out of the systems that you have. Um, but I won't go into Visual Speed today. We're here to talk about uh, migration. So we're going to start digging into that. I had a few questions that I told, so let's talk about those. So we'll start, we'll start talking about these things, but we might go into different directions also. So let's see if you can follow us. <laughs> SharePoint 2010. Coming to end of life, April 13, 2021, my notes say. Mm -hmm. A lot of companies that I've talked to in the past year have been freaked out, especially with the SharePoint 2010 designer workflows expiring as well. And all these things, uh, I used to be a master back in the day of SharePoint designer workflows. I don't know if you remember that. I, I wrote books, not book, but books on SharePoint designer. And I know how important, how powerful they were and how many people used it. That coming to end of life and the whole solution coming to end of life, the platform, many people are. Uh, scrambling to to go get off of that. Now I know you have some very specific guidance and things that that should and should not do for any migration, regardless SharePoint 2010, whatever SharePoint on prem or even SharePoint online to a different tenant and all. So I would love to hear that guidance, and I'm sure everybody else would love to hear it as well. So let's talk about that. What do you think they should be do or doing or not doing? Well, I think with any kind of migration, you have to start with an inventory. What is it that I have? And when it comes to these sort of legacy workflow business applications that you're, that you're describing, I think you have to identify what business critical applications do I have that, are, that need to be converted? Because you have to actually, you should really start focusing on them because it's almost a parallel activity. You have business, effectively you have business apps. You have to figure out what's the best way to recreate those business apps. Some of what we used to use uh, designer workflows or info path for some of that actually could be done with a straight up SharePoint list and, mm -hmm. and built in um, flows from Power Automate that you may not even need all that customization anymore. Um, but it is really important, I think, to look at your business critical applications and figure out a roadmap for that. And uh, that should be obviously number one. So an inventory of what we have, what's a business application, then what's left over is typically going to be your intranet and team collaboration spaces. And you really want to look at them and say, you know, what do we need to keep? It, do we need to retain any of it? How much of this is old? And I think that's really why understanding what you have is really important. And then thinking about what experiences you want to build so that you can decide how much of what we have needs to even come over. And I know you tease me about this, but from my perspective <laughs> on the intranet side, the going in principle should be all content left behind. 
that in general, you have to uh, take a look at the experiences that you're trying to provide. And you're going to ask each piece of content in your inventory, not like, do you spark joy? But we're going to do a little Marie Kondo on that and say, hey, have you earned the right to be in my intranet? Mm. Are you part of a user scenario, a story or an app, a task that someone needs to accomplish? Or are you dead content that no one's ever looked at? So in addition to that inventory, I'd really love to see some usage data on what content and apps that we currently have, are they actually being used? Because just because there's someone's pet doesn't necessarily mean that we need to carry that into the new house. That's so true. Uh, I think you already know the story that when Microsoft themselves became the tenant admin for so many tenants out there, you know, when SharePoint Online was first being deployed and all that stuff, and even before that BPOS, uh, they realized how much stuff is not being used, actually, you know, and this was a big uh, awakening. And I'm, I'm sure many companies are either looking at analytics or, or kind of disregarding and saying, well, we're just putting stuff out there. It, sh- it must be used. But when they do look at it, they realize, oh, my God, all this stuff that we're doing, all this investment we're making, if it's not being used, what's the point? So that realization on user adoption and, and just uh, understanding you know, what specific things we should invest in and what should we should ignore completely has been wonderful the last few years. I think you've been, I've been thinking and talking about this for many years, even before, but others have not been paying as, atten- as much attention. Uh, and you're, of course, talking about content specifically. The content functionality goes hand in hand. If it's not being used, throw it away. Why even transfer it? Uh, having said that, the mantra, which I agree with personally, but I do tease you on it, that all content left behind no one is going to do it in reality. I've never seen anybody leave all content behind. Is this going to be specific content left behind and specific content taken? I usually go with a federated model as to, all right, uh, you, you have all this content that you keep there, make it read-only, make it searchable, and the stuff that you know actively is being used, transfer that over. Depends on what you're talking there. about, right? If you're talking about documents, that's a different story because documents, you can do that. However, since I spend a lot of my time storytelling, meaning creating stories about how to get work done, um, ex, uh, creating experiences on intranets. Mm-hmm. You can't copy your pages. I'm That's sorry. True. You know, uh, most of the pages on 2010 are going to be link farms, or you have tried so hard and customized so much to make it not look like SharePoint that you can't bring it over into a modern page anyways. So from a page perspective and an opportunity perspective, it's really time to leave that behind. I mean, think about the models for our traditional intranets. They were department-based rather than experience-based, focused mostly on the content producer and less on the content consumer who doesn't really care that uh, travel reports to finance. So they're never going to look for how to uh, for travel in the context of finance if they don't know your organization. So as we have an opportunity when we are migrating off of a, a relative, I mean, 2010, that was 21 years ago. I'm an old platform um, into an, we have really we, we've changed how we think about the intranet since then. Right. And so I think it's now to and user experience, actually. And it's time to really start thinking about um, modern experiences that will relate and connect to people yeah. and um, in a more familiar and friendly way. So true. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't think about that. So it's 21 years ago. That does yeah. not compute in my mind. 2010 was 21. Well, not 21, 11 years ago. Right. Yeah. Sorry, 11 years ago. 11 yeah. years ago, yeah. Sorry. Yes, Why am I thinking 21 years. also, yeah. Uh, but even 11 years ago, that's... Uh, 2000, right? 11 yeah. years ago. Still, that's a long time. And it, both of us being from the days of SharePoint 2001, you know, that's a long time ago. Um, anyway, SharePoint itself is a very mature product. I am glad they're going to this thing. Here's Mark Cashman's post over here. He, actually, I, I even found an older post. Let me see if I got that handy. Yeah, this is from Bill Baer back in 2018, talking about wow. SharePoint Server 2010 ending. But there is still remains true that still companies are running it and they're yeah. going to be scram- scrambling and this happens all the time. I, I agree that there's a lot of stuff with pages and everything else, which just has become link form to just dump stuff. You don't want to transfer all that stuff over. Having said that, when you ask the users, they always complain. Well, like, yeah, I might need this in the future. Take it over. <laughs> and that, that becomes a struggle. Uh, and that's always been like that. It's never 
change. It's always so, going to remain like that. Right. So I often, you know, tell people, okay, then let's divide as you're looking at your inventory. Maybe could you take a look at the content that's current? It'd be nice if you mm -hmm. know how often it's been looked at, but maybe you don't even know that information. So why don't you look at maybe by date? So what's been updated in the last two years? Could we spend our time re-architecting that content, creating new experiences? You know, I can tell you that a lot of old content on your intranet is probably a bunch of PDFs that would be do much better and tell better stories if you recreated them as pages. I do this all the time as I'm bringing sort of legacy intranets to the cloud, taking mm. really critical information that was in a PDF oh, yeah. that doesn't belong in a PDF. It can't even be updated. And so it's so bringing that, making that experience so much more dynamic and visual by making it a page. Why don't we say, you know, one option is take your inventory, create an archive of everything that hasn't been touched in the last two years and literally dump it in an archive location. In mm -hmm. my dream, you put it in a site and you turn search off so it doesn't even clutter search and uh, leave it in the same structures that you currently have because you can't find them today anyways. Okay. So leave it in that same ridiculous folder structure. If you can unpack some of them so you have more libraries that so your folders aren't so nested, but take that content, put it in an archive. If you need to get it, when, when you go get that content, move it to a good location, put the metadata on it, put it in the right location, reformat it out of PDF into an either a native office format or make it a page. And then you're gradually deprecating the part of the archive that you need. And mm -hmm. maybe in a year or two, especially if you're, um, you implement some retention policies, yeah. <laughs> to all that stuff can just go away. Maybe it should go away, actually, so that's not discoverable and uh, not cluttering up search. So I think you have an opportunity. And I realize that usually it's the time crunch. Um, yeah. We don't have enough time to review. And oh my God, we saved this till the last minute. We procrastinated on doing anything. So in that model, I'm working with a client right now, then th that's exactly what we're doing. Prioritize, choose where you want to spend your calories. And focus on the content that's the highest value to the users, ideally as demonstrated by it gets used. But the other proxy for value would be recency. Let's talk about the destination where they end up at. You know, mm -hmm. before before we just had SharePoint, SharePoint on prem. Now we have SharePoint Online and a bunch of other applications. So then you think about, well, do I need <clears throat> Uh, you know, things I used to use, structures I used to use in SharePoint now where I have other things within applications like Planner, mm -hmm. my whole project, uh, like a light project server that I could do. Or do I need discussion boards where I have now Teams and I have Yammer and all that other stuff. Uh, just storing my media content. I have Stream now for that and many more. So when you're doing that information tr structure, I guess information transfer planning, mm -hmm. are there specific things that you follow in your mind as to here, this is where the content is going to live going forward, even if it's new content or old content? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on how open the container is, but the easiest answer for me, and I'm working on it with a client on this right now is, if you're using that SharePoint, not 2010, but 2013 community site template, mm -hmm. or you're using a discussion board that is open to the organization, that's easy, yammer, bingo, yeah. done. Yeah. And so you have to get over the fact that you're going to lose all of that legacy discussion. As, um, but again, it, not particularly searchable the way it is today. Highly doubt there's any useful value in it. However, could you dump it all out and then make it a searchable document? Yeah, I bet you could. And that may be the best way to handle some of that legacy content. Hmm. Um, Port it, but don't try to recreate it necessarily. And I think that content is relatively easy. Yammer is such a great place to have a threaded conversation, which is what we really wanted to do with those discussion boards. The community site template actually came out in SharePoint 2013 at the moment that Microsoft bought Yammer. And so there was an immediate sort of conflict. I use that template and say in SharePoint or go with Yammer. Initially, there may have been some hesitation about going to Yammer because if you were totally on-prem, uh, Yammer has never been an on-prem pro mm -hmm. product. And so you may have had to stay with that community site template. Fast forward uh, from 2013 to 2021, and now everything else is in the cloud. Why shouldn't that conversation be? So um, it's, you know, each of the applications has a scenario for which it is best suited. And there is some it overlap, is. of course. And 
there are always going to be those it depends scenarios. But I yeah. think for the most part, discussion boards are going to end up, they'll translate the most effect conceptually, most effectively into Yammer. Uh, since I've started working with Microsoft products, which is middle, not middle, actually beginning of 1990s, I think, uh, I've always found there to be overlap. Always. Oh, yeah. well, and that's never changed. I don't think it's ever going to change. That's just the DNA of Microsoft, how they do it. And we see it and we're able to try to guide our customers as to here's where you want to do it. Still in our minds, I don't know if, if you feel that way. I still feel like mm, I'm on the fence with this one. For example, <laughs> I mean, something that I have struggled with, I think I've gotten a lot better with is Teams versus Yammer and both. Of course, we talked about both. Yeah. It's an age old uh, you know, conversation that has continued, outer loop, inner loop, but then there's so many other things that teams you know, just gets built and built and more now, I think it was like 10,000 members or something you can have in a channel. I can't remember what the it's current- In a now. team. I think it's a going team, In a team, part. okay. Do you have a specific, I, I don't want to go into the- Yeah, whole I mean, I do. I actually versus, have, I have a whole, do? I've written sort of conver- uh, blog posts about sort of Teams versus Yammer, but I, there's yeah. a general guidance. And yeah. sometimes I actually, and so I do have, I mean, I think Yammer is the hero app for community, cross-functional communities of practice. Okay. It has a really nice threaded conversation experience. You can associate um, Yammer conversations with topics, which effectively give them that concept of a channel. But generally in communities of practice, they're more focused on conversation than documents. Mm-hmm not always focused on producing a deliverable, more about connecting people to people. And for me, it fits really nicely in the intention and goal of a community, which is more people come and go based on interest and it stays alive based on um, wanting that discipline, you know, trying to uh, share knowledge about that discipline. Whereas a team typically has a start and an end. It has a set of activities. You're not typically volunteering to be on a team, you are assigned to a team. And so it's very different conceptually from what a community of practice is. So in general, communities of practice seemed to work mostly best in Yammer and yeah. Teams is the hero app for teamwork. I wouldn't tell anyone. I used to think it was, um, I was appalled when people use Yammer for team <laughs> collaboration. I'm like, no, that's not what its strengths are, but it plays very nicely in uh, Microsoft Teams in yeah. that space. However, that doesn't mean that I am not currently recommending to a very small organization that they use teams for their communities. Why? Because I can't, their heads are going to explode if we introduce yes. one more yes. application. And even though their communities are go- could be in Microsoft Teams, they're going from a non-Microsoft platform into mm-hmm. Microsoft. And they're going to have a hard enough time getting used to not creating uh, the G kind of documents and starting to work all in office that I think you have to sometimes baby step into these things. And so um, I think we may change some of these cross-functional teams into Yammer communities over time. But for right now, um, this may be the better place to go. And yet I have also worked with organizations that have uh, very small organizations that are very happily using Yammer yeah. for leadership engagement and cross-functional yeah. communities, and they're teeny, teeny, tiny. So honestly, it, it, it's you know, it's not just about the technology. It's about the maturity of the organization. It's about the change Culture. fatigue mm. of the people and what is going to work as we're crawling, walking, and running to get to that level of maturity that allows us to take advantage of um, everything that makes sense for our organization. Yeah, very much agree with everything you said. Uh, I'll just add over here that uh, I know the messaging has been many times where it's Teams and Yammer, and I agree for big organizations, but uh, for certain ones, even if they're big or, or small, doesn't matter the size, you have to look at the obviously the, the actual culture, uh, what's going to work best for them or not, and go with the tool that makes sense. And at the end of the day, you want to simplify and not complexify. I'm a big, big proponent of simplifying. And sometimes simplifying really literally means cutting off a tool and just working with one tool, if that's what it takes. You'd never want to have a person second guess themselves as to, I know I had this conversation, or I know a person put this in somewhere, but should I go to Yammer? Should I go to Teams? Should I go to Outlook uh, Conversations? Should I go here? 
That should never be the case. Should, well, you know, there's another not. way to simplify. And I actually, the client I'm working with now that's leaving the G Suite into um, Microsoft 365 said, you know, one of the challenges that they've had previously is that they've had no other G word governance <laughs> and everyone was allowed to do what they want. And they mm -hmm. are now really frustrated because every different department has taken a different view of how they want to organize their work. And there's no way to pull it all together. And what sure. they've realized is that they are a customer centric organization and yet very few um, of their departments has anything organized in a way to make that to make it easy to find content related to a customer. So you know pay me now or pay me later you're going to have to decide what you want to do and how you want to organize your content and what they asked me to do as we move to Microsoft is to be more prescriptive mm -hmm. and, we, and what we would be specifically saying is if this is your scenario use Yammer. In other words not give people too many choices. Just say, and yes, I know there are scenarios where it may be, um, we'd be on the fence about which tool to use or which application makes the most sense. But in what they've desperately asked for, and I think this is, people don't want too many choices. They want you to say, they want guidance that says, yeah. this is what you should do in this scenario. I remember someone telling me about 10 years ago, we didn't even have all these options. And it was um, my favorite, actually, my favorite thing that got deprecated because no one used it was the meeting workspace. I really loved that. Um, I thought it was really great. And what my client said to me is, if you're going to tell me to use that, that's fine. But you have to tell me that you use it for all scenarios. I don't mm -hmm. want 17 choices for how to do something. Pick yeah. one and tell me what to do. And even if I don't like it, I will do it and I'll get used to it. And then, and, and it'll be, become part of what I do. Just don't ask me to think so hard yeah. every time I want to do something. So just say, if this, do that. If this, do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Especially right now with a lot of folks working from home, the prescriptive guidance is required. You have yeah. to do that. Let me, let's change the subject here so we have enough time to talk about everything here. We were talking about earlier before the whole uh, notion of SharePoint Online versus SharePoint On-Premises, right? And I pulled up a couple of articles. One is by Status Point IT here, computersupport.com. Uh, and one is by our friends at ShareGate. You know, these are the first two that came up when I did a search for it. Just wanted to have some visuals of while we talk about it. Do you have any specific thoughts as to, well, do you have any clients currently who are on SharePoint 2019? And if yes, why? Um, or just SharePoint so, on-premises, I guess they're staying on any version of SharePoint on-premise. Right now in my world, the only on-prem clients I have are moving to the cloud. Okay. And so I, I have been saying for years, you know, the situation with the cloud is not an if, it's a when. <laughs> and um, at some point we're all going there, whether you like it or not. I do know, I, so I, I have I worked with clients that will are not likely to go to the cloud anytime soon. Sure. So there's always the DOD yeah. space and other kinds of organizations, but even some that you would think would never go to the cloud are actually maybe in hybrid mode. Yes. So I've worked with a bunch of utilities where some content, um, things that they have not felt were compliant enough to mm -hmm. meet some of their like NERC SIP guidance kind of things, like regulations. Yeah. Although I think now that may not even be the case anymore, but things where they were still sort of hesitant to put certain types of content in the cloud. Um, they might have certain kinds of content uh, on-prem and the rest of everything else in the cloud. And the way they make that work is by ha having search that indexes the whole thing. Yeah, um, very similar. And I'll add to this as well that we, we still have a bunch of clients who are on SharePoint on-prem by choice, mm -hmm. uh, but every single one, maybe with the exception of one that I can think of, has some small hybrid environment, have, has more one environment out there where they have the licenses anyway. Microsoft has given them free licenses for right. Office 365, so they turned it on in this non-secure, but that's what they call it, non-secure environment. <laughs> non-sensitive environment and then they yeah. go there to certain things yeah Which i would have? not use the word non-secure okay. i'm Maybe sorry Maybe less not. sensitive but boy okay. it can't be more <laughs> i mean i don't think honestly i don't think i think one sort of thing about the cloud that people are afraid about security i don't think you could be any more secure yeah than you know i have a story about that actually i've actually said this at conferences i don't know if you remember me saying this story but i always think of it this way whenever we used to travel back in the day when we used to go to conferences 
uh, I, I would have my laptop with me. I'm sure everybody had their laptop with them. And when you're going down from your hotel room to the conference floor or to just go out somewhere, you, you're always thinking about what are my valuables, including, uh, you know, of course, my laptop and maybe my password if I'm doing, you know, if I'm going to Europe or something. Do you take that with you or do you put it into a safe within the hotel room that is, you know, is super, super quote unquote safe? Now, Safe, yes, it's going to be more secure with, than with you in your pocket or your backpack, which somebody can steal, take take from you. But that sense of security that you have, because it's in my on my body, in my space, is just a, that that sense of security that's irreplaceable. It's in our minds, and it mm-hmm. it, it is a, a fact. So yes, Microsoft when they store our content in Azure, it is super secure, absolutely. But it's not with me. It's not mm-hmm. something that I can touch. And I've heard people say this thing. And it is true. It's, it's more of our, we're humans. So our minds think like that. So I don't want to call it not secure or uh, obviously it's super secure, but it is true that when I have sensitive data that I feel sensitive, I would like to cure, keep it on my person instead of putting it out there somewhere. And that's just the mentality that, that many com- companies are still following. <laughs> Hope that makes sense. Yes. Uh, so having said that, what, what I was <laughs> starting to say over here that yeah, that many companies who are actually turning on this hybrid environment, having a small non-sensitive part of their environment, I guess, where they're putting their stuff. Some of them are realizing, just like you said, so that, you know, it's not so bad after all, and we can trust it. And they're moving workloads slowly, one by one, or sometimes in batches from their on-prem environment to the cloud. Whether they'll go completely cloud, I can bet that some of them will never go completely cloud whether they're going to have lots of workloads in the cloud so they can compete better and they have a a better versatility of how they do business. Absolutely. It's going to happen for most of them, but sometimes it is a a process, you know, which is, which takes years. And I've heard Jeff Taper and Satya Nadella talk about that. They they will support our customers who are hybrid and who are on-prem and who are cloud. We'll Mm -hmm. go with their journey together, which is a great way of doing so instead of taking a hard stance on it. Yeah. So that's wonderful uh, doing that. Having said all that stuff, SharePoint 2019, I've seen uh, people messaging me here. Let me turn this off. (laughs) So I have uh, definitely SharePoint 2019 is a great product. Uh, SharePoint, it looks very much like SharePoint Online. Obviously, when you're in SharePoint 2019, you don't have certain workloads like Planner, as we talked about, like other stream, or unless you turn those things on in the cloud. Uh, Do you have... I guess this is more of a uh, subjective question as to, are there any specific check box that you would have to check to say, all right, these are the reasons that I would stay on-prem aside from security. Can you think of anything else? Um, I, I, yeah, I don't think security is the best reason. Right. I think it's really more industry specific regulated content perhaps that um, for whatever reason, yeah. Um, isn't allowed to be in the cloud. So more and is. more that's going away, but I feel like, for example, you know, defense environment, I'm not saying that, I mean, when you think about it, it's just a secure cloud. It's not necessarily, it's not a public cloud. It's a, a private secure cloud. So I guess I don't, um, it's very much organizational, organization and industry specific, I think. And I think one of the things that we were talking about before uh, was just the whole amount of updates, right? The the amount of changes that happen in the cloud. Uh, for folks who have worked with the cloud before, like in Salesforce and SAP and other like that, like that uh, they're pretty used to it before coming to the Microsoft space. But Microsoft folks who have, uh, you know, kind of grown up in the office desktop client and the SharePoint on-prem kind of space, they were not used to that frequency of change. And those folks are still struggling as to, okay, well, are you saying Microsoft, are you going to change things on me all the time? And I'll just find out after the fact, no, 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 I'm not okay with that. Uh, so that's also a big, big, uh, that checkbox that people say, all right, well, I do not want that. And that's the reason I'm staying on SharePoint aside from other perceived security and other concerns like that. Yeah. I mean, I haven't had anyone actually say, I don't want to go to the cloud because of the frequency of change. They have said, oh, when we go to the cloud, we have to figure out how we're going to manage the frequency of change. And I think that's totally true, but I haven't yeah. seen that as a, we won't do it because it's just, you have to take on the recognition that anything that is new is always going to be harder to adopt than that which you are used to. Mm-hmm. That's human psychology. 
and it, it doesn't have anything to do with the technology. And unless the technology, I think the data says like nine times obviously better than what you're currently doing, there will be that uh, hurdle, that change hurdle to get over. And that's where you have to think about um, you know, adoption and ambassadors, champions in yeah. your organization who you can train early. You need to think about learning programs where you can give people just in time learning, hey, you know, you're about to do something you've never done it before. I just noticed that now every tenant I'm in has the new, um, have you ever created a page? When you're creating a new page, you get prompted. Have you ever done yeah. this before? Let us walk you through it if you haven't. So again, um, you can de- manage that change much more effectively if you can bring that information to someone at the time that they actually need it and will be paying attention to it. Yeah. So you, know, you might know a little about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, both of us are, of course, huge proponents of just-in-time help, just-in-time, uh, you know, uh, training, just-in-time, everything. Just especially right now, where you are not sitting in a cubicle or an office, and you can't just talk to somebody right next to you. You don't want that aloneness factor to be something that depresses people. You know, uh, just uh, yes, at the moment of need, in context of their environment, in the flow of their work, are the phrases I say every single day, as you must know, obviously. That's what we focus on at Visual SP, <laughs> uh, and we try to get better and better at it. So having said that, um, I guess the other part of it is the user migration. I've seen companies since the beginning, since SharePoint 2001, my, the first migration I saw, until now, a company still very much focus on their systems and technology and not as much on their users, which still surprises me. You know, when I used to be a developer, I didn't, I never thought about that. When I became a trainer for developers, I didn't, still didn't think about that. Same thing with administrators, like oh, whatever, you know, we're gonna focus on what we need to do here to administration. Once I got into the whole power user and then end, at the end, end user, I started thinking a lot more about it, which is the last decade. And now I think back to myself that, oh my God, I can't believe that I never thought about this thing. Without users, it's like, uh, the analogy that I always make is like you got this big, huge jumbo jet that you're flying everywhere around the, the world and, and looks great because you're looking at it in the sky. But when you look inside, there's nobody sit, sitting in the and you're in your jumbo jet. What's the point? Uh, how, what do you advise your uh, you know, customers as to thinking about the user migration when you're thinking about the technology migration, how important that is? Well, I mean, obviously, considering people and what they do and what they need to know is critically important. One thing that I think it's important to know, to think about is that not everyone needs the same amount of information in order to get started. And I try to focus on not necessarily training everything you might possibly be able to do in Teams or in SharePoint or in whatever, but what you need to be comfortable that you can get your work done on the day that we cut over. So when we take our 2010 intranet and we now move it to the cloud and now we're getting an entirely different SharePoint experience. It's probably better. I mean, in fact, it's 100% better because now I can you know, get it on my phone and I can whatever. Leading up to that, however, we need to make sure people are aware of what's happening. One really great way, by the way, to engage users is to bring them along as you are thinking about the change. So in my world of information architecture, we have a few user testing kind of approaches, you know, card sorting and tree testing. One of the reasons, and actually stakeholder interviews and observation, by the way, to see how people are using things today. One of the reasons you do all these things is to learn and improve and get a better outcome. The other reason you do it is to get more people involved. And I keep thinking back to that Windows 7 commercial. You remember (laughs) that? We had a whole bunch of different people saying, looking at a feature going, oh, that was my idea. And what I want to happen when these major changes happen, I want everyone in the organization to see something and say, oh, that's what I told them to do. I asked for that because the whole point is if we treat it as a tool that an application that IT is delivering, no one wants that. But if you say, hey, I created this solution, I was part of developing a solution that I need because it helps me get my work done. And if you haven't been able to see that yet, colleague, who I may actually see in the office because you're sitting next to me or in a chat with me. Let me show you how it's changed my what I do and how it's helped me be more productive. We want, mm-hmm. it's not, you know, IT's solution, it's our solution. And Absolutely. we all want to feel pride of ownership. 
And the more we can engage people in the process of transition and creation, the better off we'll be. That's why champions programs are so critical. That's why having people who understand adoption is so critical because again, we're almost as humans, we're vested more in that which we know Absolutely. than that which we don't know. And we need to sort of bridge that gap. And there's a lot of data and uh, that we know about sort of what makes for a good change program, what helps people adopt new technologies. We shouldn't ignore that. I mean, we just have to we can't, we don't have the luxury, to be honest. I mean, right. Um, Honestly, I'm learning a lot of these same exact lessons that I have been learning for my kids. It's the same exact thing. If I make it feel like it's their idea, yeah. it sinks in a lot better. They're more apt to do it than if it's dad's idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and it works the same way. We're all, like you said, we're all humans. It's just human psychology. Yeah. I have felt in my own career that I have come from the technology space to the psychology space. I've gone from technologist to a psychologist. And it's, it's this, and marrying it all together actually makes a big difference because you are at the end of the day dealing with humans. It's that, about that's systems. why I always tell people I didn't know it at the time, but my undergraduate major was psychology, and then my <laughs> um, in business school I focused on information systems management. I feel like I got the perfect educational background awesome. to do what I did twenty years after I graduated. But um, I, you know, I, I that's why I say I always fo I focus on the people side of technology. Yes. I come from that world. And I'm not a developer, although I've done it. But the last language I used was Fortran, so you really don't want me oh, uh, to do any it. development, right? So I mean, I come from so I come from a world of what I call regular people, and so I always say to people, "Look, if I understand it mm -hmm. and I can explain it to someone else, then I know it's not super hard." But if it's so complex that I have to ask you ten thousand questions and I have to make a million analogies. Um, and Changing. then, yeah, that we, we need to think of another way, maybe another way of explaining it, another metaphor, something that makes it clear. Yeah. So true. So true. I think this is the reason that it comes natural to you uh, because of your education and your experience in psychology and information systems at the same time. Not everybody thinks about this thing as naturally and seamlessly as you do. Uh, I mean, I, I also could be that. because like there's no dumber user than me, honestly. <laughs> I know many, I know many, many people who, uh, <clears throat> anyway, we won't go that route. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, I think we need to treat everyone with respect and provide them the answers and information they need to be able to make their day easier, make their job easier. And that's exactly and that's what I think it's really, and that's why I really, I'll, let's come back to this. I really believe it's about comfort yeah. initially more than training. Make me so, comfortable that I can continue true. to do what I need to do. Uh, and then as I'm ready to learn more, I, I'll be much more interested in learning it when I need to know it. Absolutely. And that's why sort of learning in the flow of work is so critical because uh, I mean, training that you don't use, you may, mm -hmm. you just, you'll never get that time back in your life because you won't remember it and it won't be applicable training when you need to know something. Um, I, ideally because not five minutes before you need to know it, but hopefully uh, training in the context of what you're tr uh, trying Absolutely. to accomplish means you can practice it as well. So Imagine if you went to a uh, cell phone store, I won't mention a specific dealer, but if you went there and they said, okay, we're going to give you this new cell phone, but you got to sit here, you got to listen to the whole spiel of what's new with it, and I'm going to train you, and then you can go. <laughs> like, I don't want your cell phone, let me go somewhere else. I mean, we upgrade all the time. Every year these days, people upgrade, but we don't look at every single feature. We discover them as we go along. You know, So the same exact thing should be in our intranet, in our digital workspaces, everywhere else. Let me start let me dig into it and then continue my journey instead of just having it a one-time learning and then doing. Yeah, my only thing is you want to make sure that people aren't frustrated because they don't know something. And that's really the catch-22. Well, onboarding is, and awareness, I think, then training. Yeah, that's well, why. it's, oh, I didn't know you could do it that way. Honestly, <laughs> I learn new things every single day. And it's like, oh my God, why didn't I yeah. know that before? Um, I wish someone had told me that. Well, who would have told me? Like how would someone have known that I was struggling? Cause I wouldn't even have known that there was a question to ask. Mm. So there is a little bit of, Hey, there are some common features that yeah. maybe people didn't know about. I, I learned something the other day um, to uh, reopen a tab that you closed yeah. in the browser. I didn't even mm -hmm. know you could do that. Yeah. With a, a keyboard key. I'm like, Oh, I, tr I wished I could do that <laughs> along. I didn't know that was there. So, I mean, that's the, that's the, the danger with just-in-time learning is that there are also some 
features that would make your life 10 times easier if you knew about them. And so that's where we're balancing all Yeah, it's definitely a combination where you sometimes dig into certain things and then you come out and you know, now you're working and then you figure things out as you go along. Absolutely. It's a and, not an or. Right. Cool. So uh, we're almost out of time here, but any of the last words, Sue, from you? And uh, no, I just, I, one thing I would say is that all of this is a journey and obviously you have to, um, there is a deadline for people who are leaving the, you know, 2010 environment, they're going to have to do something. Uh, but I, th- and if, honestly, if you're thinking about it today, it's a little late. It's already too late. Yeah. It, it's almost already too late. So I think you're going to have to think about balancing your desired end state outcome with what's practical given your timeline. And, yeah. and that's what I would advise. Of course, we started talking about SharePoint 2010 in specific, but you know, it's about every other migration as well as 2013, 2016, 2019, or even if you're coming from outside, like you said, G Suite, if you're coming in over here, what are the things that you think about? So the next time you have to make a change, it's not as painful. You know, the information architecture you should be planning for. It's all about planning a strategy. Yeah. Most people, unfortunately, and even companies just don't do it as well. Uh, so got to get better at doing it the right way, hopefully this time around. So the next time that you have to do it, it's not as painful. That's always my advice to folks. It's the measure once, cut twice, or whatever. They measure twice, cut once. I think that's what it is. <laughs> Whichever. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense to think about things before you actually do it. Yep. Just like I should have thought about this saying before I said it. (laughs) Anyway, it's always a good time talking with you, Sue. So I hope the listeners out there got something out of it as well. Thanks very much for joining us today. And uh, until next time. So thank you. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye.